is talking to somebody uh, recently who told me he'll just do like a notch on the Pro Q3 and 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 uh, and and side chain to that, like just like, and then you could just like literally take out like 80 hertz from you yeah. know a bass or something. So I've been doing that. I used to do it also with the the isotope plug, the neutron plugin, but it works really well on the P- Pro Q3. I did. I'd... Oh, and what? So the so on the Pro Q3 when it notches down, that's being. Yeah. It's being fed from a side chain. You have to do else. it in dynamic mode, right? You do the Pro Q3 in dynamic, yeah. in dynamic mode. Mm-hmm. I use it in dynamic mode quite a lot, but I don't use that for side chain. I use the Pro MB mm. for side chain quite a lot. Right. You could go really, yeah, you could go really yeah. detailed. The with fab it. filter stuff's great. I use that all over everything. So you could just like, if the kick is hitting at like 60 hertz, like you could do a notch, you could do a dynamic notch at about 60 hertz on the bass and then just like Sick. dip it out like 4 to 6 dB or whatever, you know, every time it hits. Amazing. Yeah. So I've been I've been do, I've been messing with that. So so shout out to Fernando Lodero for that 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 I'll be, tip. I'll be using that tip. Thank you. <laughs> Always pleasure. Yeah. Wait. So I know that you you worked at Spitfire for a bit. I'd love to hear a little bit about what goes into you know creating sample libraries. What can you what can you share with the audience? It, yes. Well, at Spitfire we we got I was a sample editor, so that involved getting these huge. Pro Tools projects and they'd have recorded somewhere at Air or um, some other big studio and it will be either an orchestra or it will be solo orchestral players were generally the the patches that I'd work on and uh, so either you get them playing like note at a time usually a tone apart and they do maybe like three or four round robins so a round robin is where you, they so you don't get that like um, what's it called is it a shotgun effect when you're when you're playing like a C on a violin, so it's not exactly the same sample each time. Oh, You'd use oh about, yeah, like, yeah. Four round robins so that it sounds more realistic. Got it. And it would cycle through the samples. Mm-hmm. Did a lot of that. Um, and then after that, you'd export that. You'd denoise it, so I learned how to use isotope really well, and you'd tune anything that needed to be tuned, and you'd, yeah, get rid... There's obviously a lot of musicians who were, who were stuck in a recording studio for a long time doing the same note so there'd be a lot of like shuffling or coughing and you'd have to go into rx and like almost oh, surgically paint out no way any of those noises wow. and then you build it into a contact patch and check that everything worked and you could play it and you'd make sure that the the release like if if your finger came off the midi keyboard you'd make sure that that would trigger the release of the note rather than just a fade out if that makes sense so it sounds like they're really, really good at making something as sound as real as possible. Wow. Which was interesting because I, when I did my prepared piano EP at uni. So detailed. I I kind of made my own contact patches with the piano from from my uni. But it was like looking back, it was so undetailed. Like now I feel like I'd be able to create a sample library a little bit better. Yeah, back then I'd kind of use just a few notes. I didn't have any round robins and I'd use a few notes for kind of the entire keyboard. It was very, very unnaturalistic, but fun. Yeah. Taught me contact. Wow, that's crazy. Probably takes so much work to make a sample. Yeah, it does. Yeah, they're very, very good at it. They've got really good process done. Yeah. And and, and are these like multiple microphones for every like, are you like sorting through multiple microphones and creating like a a general picture or is it like you're already given like the the kind of balance of the microphones? We we never did any of the mixes. Um, There were some people there sort of designated to that job. But they did, when they went and record, they had tons of different microphones because, oh, yeah, because you can have the, on contact or on the, I think they've got their own app now, like mm-hmm. their own plugin app for it. But you can have, whether it's further away or closer to the spot mics. So they had all of the different blends, I guess, between the mics and you wow. can kind of mix between it that way. So yeah, very, very smart algorithms, the way they worked. So much detail. That's wild. Mm-hmm. It sounds It sounds super... I don't want to say boring, but monotonous to to make it. Was, to make yeah, a sample the library. actual work was quite was quite monotonous, but um, but the end, it's a fun company end to result work for, was, and the end result is just beautiful. Was, yeah. Do you know which libraries you worked on? I can't remember the main names of them now. Some good ones. Some, good, some ones. good ones. <laughs> Definitely on the orchestral ones, rather than any of the weird ones. I've only ever used the labs. But, good, um, yeah, it wasn't any of the lab stuff, but it was. Um, yeah, it was good. It was good. <laughs> Somebody uh, told me about their what's it called? Their like their Beatles piano one. I forgot what it's called. Mrs. Mills. Maybe, oh, amazing! Or something. What they have sampled the Beatles Apparently. piano? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> like the Lady Madonna piano. Sick. Uh, yeah. What 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 don't they have at this point? Right? Like we got everything. Literally, yeah. It's mad. 
But it's still, even as detailed as they are, and as amazing as those sample libraries are, they still obviously don't beat the real thing. So it's, it's a shame sometimes. Right. A lot of people do the trick, don't they, where they have, I think some producers or, or writers, they'll make a strings arrangement and they'll want to have loads and loads of players, um, but they can't afford going to a big studio with an orchestra. So then they'll just hire one one session player, like one violinist, for example, mm-hmm. and they'll get them to play the lead melody line. And then they'll just have all of the MIDI, the sample library in the background. But because they've got that one player in that one space, it sounds a little bit more real. More real. Yeah. I did that actually on my, the, the one album I made for myself. And I, I just had a violinist come in to do like, like a string line. And then I just uh-huh. embellished it with the MIDI underneath it and it kind of made it feel a little bit less synthesized. And it, and it worked, right? Yeah, it did work. It did work. And then I did a recently, I mixed a record now that, that has like real violin. It's just like a lot of tracks of the same violin, same microphone, same location. And it also sounds great, you know? So it just depends on the arrangement. You can make anything work, I guess. So, you know, working with the artists that you're working with, you know, do you find you have to, you have to balance your creative vision with their vi- vision? How do you kind of deal with communication and making sure that everybody's on the same page? Well, I think generally the musicians where I'm doing long, long-term projects with them, I'll really already love their music and that's why I'm working with them, I guess, or why we've ended it. It never seems to be a thing of like, I'm seeking them out and I've gone to them and I've said, hey, I want to be your producer on your album. It's kind of, generally it's always worked quite Mm -hmm. organically, but it still is because we've had some sort of combined love of a similar genre or I've heard one of their songs and it's, it's, it's right up my street to work on. And so in terms of balancing, it's not felt like I've had to force anything too much um, I think uh, similarly to how I was saying earlier, you sort of have to learn how an artist will respond to you suggesting something. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to phrase this, but like, yeah. Being able to delicately say, this isn't quite working for this song. Let's try something else. But you can do it like sometimes quite excitedly being like, we should also try this and also try this. And like, Someone was telling me that if you say something the right way, you can you can get the artist to think it was their idea yes, and not your yeah, idea. I think that might have happened before as well. But um but it always feels like quite a combined effort. I think sometimes I come out of of a record with somebody and I'll be like, what exactly did I contribute creatively? And then I'll sort of think back and it'll actually be quite a lot because it is that sort of combined thing, rather than anything being like, This was definitely my idea. It's it's such a like organic way working with people where you're both like building and like snowballing ideas together. That it is, it's always, I think most of the stuff I work with is very, very collaborative. Yeah, that's awesome. Do, do you take songwriting credit when you work on a, on, on a record in that kind of collaborative? No, generally just um, just production credits or points. Yeah, yeah. As it so not, not necessarily on the writing, unless there's something that I've like definitely written, but generally it'll just be Yeah, be I'm the same way. I feel like maybe it's smart to take songwriting credit, but I, I just, I don't know. I, I doesn't. I've never been able to kind of make that work for me, you know. I've kind of just been no, like, I'm yeah. a I'm a service pr- provider. <laughs> Pay me for my services, and yeah, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm similar with that. Nice. And and do, and are you mixing also for records that you're not producing? Are you getting any freelance mixing work as well? Yes. Um, Project Hilts, the band that I was telling you about, I generally just mix for them. Um, and Mills, one of the guys that you mentioned earlier, I just mix for him. He's a brilliant producer. He I met him from through Spitfire actually. Uh, but yeah, he's, yeah, he's a brilliant producer and he's, he's one of those people who brings up, he brings a very, very high standard to you already. And you're like, damn, how can I actually make this better? I, I don't know. And then you do it and you're like, you, you do add the extra like 15, 20% on top of what he's done. Um, but it's nice getting projects like that. Yeah. So a few little bits, but they feel less in, yeah, I guess naturally they feel a lot less involved because you're not there through the entire process. You're kind of just there for the mix bit at the end. Mm -hmm. And I'm mixing my my friend Ben's, um, some of his album at the moment, a few tracks from it. And he's similar where he's really, really brilliant producer, brings something to quite a high standard already. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just taking it the extra mile. Yeah. Nice. It's good. And are you working with Katie? Do you have a mastering engineer that you are collaborating with? How, when, I, I'm finding for me mastering is is massive. Yeah, huge, huge. Generally, I'll go for Katie unless the artist has somebody else in mind. Yeah, or have worked with them before. But Katie's brilliant. She she mastered my EP. That was 
Now, I met her through Red Bull, actually. She was doing like a normal not novelty event. Um, yeah, and then she mastered my EP and I've kind of kept in touch with her throughout. I haven't actually met her in person that many times, but um, but whenever we chat on the phone, it's it's always nice. So her and then a, a, there's a girl called Cicely Bolston as well. So she's just mastered Nio stuff. She's brilliant. She works at Out of Air, I think, quite a lot. Yeah, there's somebody else we use for for Project Hills. It's really bad. I don't know their name, but it's the same as Heyo Mastering. And that was one where I didn't know them at all because generally I like I like working with people I know and at least having a chat or like even a WhatsApp conversation. Right. And that was one where I really, really didn't know them at all, but they came back with brilliant masters. So Yeah, I'm finding that as I get better at mixing, the mastering is just an easier process because it's, you know, I guess there's less uh, less issues that they're trying to work out. Uh, and then it just kinds up being yeah, yeah, yeah. more your vision, just more realized. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. But the but but like you said, like the WhatsApp chat, I just like like I I'm I'm mastering with a guy named Connor uh, Salmoral in Toronto. And it's just having that communication thing is is so clutch because it's just like cool. Like what what am I going for? Like and like how can we get it to the finish line and still be the vision that you know me and the artist wants is like. Because because uh, the mm-hmm. mastering ha- has a lot of power to kind of like be it your like continue to be your vision or not to be your vision, you know they could they, yeah completely they could totally completely. smash it into a different direction. I learned the hard way with with my record when I made a record and then I, I just had to remaster it. Uh, with the same. Uh-huh. I mean, I sat with the same person and remastered it because uh-huh. I was just like, this isn't working. And then I I read the Bob Katz book and I got all like obsessed with it and went down the whole rabbit hole. <laughs> Did you? Because for me, it is still a little bit of a mysterious dark art and I, I have been wanting to read up on it more. I'm understanding it more. More than reading the books, I, I just found interviewing mastering engineers to be like the biggest game changer for me. <laughs> so I'm kind of yeah, spoiled in that I sense. Bet. Like I got to speak with Pete Lyman, who masters for, you know, Chris Stapleton and... Weezer and stuff so <laughs> that's cool. it's just crazy to I don't know it seems like the, the the deal with mastering could be a lot of things and it's but it's it's been an interesting learning process for me to kind of understand what that can be and um and I definitely don't think I want to be a mastering engineer no I don't think I do either but um I'd love to know more about it I'd love to just know what magic yeah. they put on things yeah. but I definitely I hate I hate it if a, a an artist says can you master well, not if they ask it, that's fine. But I hate it if somebody tries to get you to master something you, that yes. you've mixed. I just don't, I think it just needs another pair of ears on anything that you do. Um, yeah. Even if it's just like a tiny little release, I just definitely prefer somebody else having yeah. a pair of ears on it other than mine. Unfortunately, you know, there's going to be demo quality stuff that you're, you know, at least at least where, where I'm at, you know, in the in, in in my career, I'm still working on demo stuff. For that sometimes I just have to put the you know the Pro L2 on it and call it a day. But uh, oh yeah, whenever I can, I'm sending out. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> awesome. So, so let's move on to the sauce segment. We could kind of hear a little bit about what we're talking about in terms of your production mixing style. Uh, you talk. Uh, you sent me a track called Double Pink by Andis Fi, which is yet to be released. Um, mm-hmm. and I don't think it'll even be released by the time this episode airs, but eventually it will, and people should keep an ear out. Uh, so we'll have a listen to that for about 90 seconds, uh, and then we'll talk a bit about what went into it. Thank you. 
Yeah, it sounds awesome.